Wonderful to see you all this morning. Wonderful as always. I always rejoice when I see you. I don't know whether you rejoice when you see me. <laughs> I suppose it depends on afterwards. So I'm going to read to us verse 10 of Psalm 51. But this morning we're going to look at this verse in a completely new way. We know the verse so well. It seems like these days we are always looking at verses that we know very well. But then we realize there is something that we have not seen or known before. Isn't that wonderful? Old scriptures made new. We're just going to look at this one verse, Psalm 51 and verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And we must think of that create, create in me a clean heart. What would you have expected him to say? If he was after a clean heart. Just watch this one, you know. Maybe you can do something with this one, but... This is the amazing thing. We're going to pick this up through all our readings this morning. Create in me a clean heart. And we're going to understand why that word is used there. Even so far back in the Old Testament. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. Good morning. How are you all this morning? Oh, James, you smell nice and clean. <laughs> what did you do this morning? That you smell so clean. Oh, then it must have been last night. What did you do last night? That you smell so clean. What do you think you did? Shower? Yeah. Did you have one? This morning? Oh, yes, you look like a brand new sixpence. So, I was wondering who could tell me, because in the Bible it speaks a lot about the Lord washing. The Lord is, the Lord is like a mum. does lots of washing. Actually, there's quite a few dads also do washing, though. Washing. What do we do when we do the washing? Or when we take a shower? Why? Oh, you jump into it. <laughs> ah. Why do you wash the clothes? So they stay clean and they don't stick. Oh, good. Because they're dirty. Now, you know, the Lord is also in that washing business. The whole Bible is full of places where it speaks that he washes, and he washes, and he washes, and he washes. But now I want us this morning, I want you to tell me what are the different ways in which the Lord washes us. Okay, Sarah? He washes our feet. Wow, he washes our feet with water. Yeah, he washes our feet. Lovely. How else does he wash us, does it say? What did he use to wash us in that way? What did he what does he use to wash our sins? His blood. Wow, so he washes us with his blood. But there are more ways. There are quite a number of ways in which the Lord washes us. So Sarah's quite right, he uses his blood. What else does he use? Who knows? 
What else does he use? You'll be quite amazed. He's just washing, 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 washing all the time with different things. So his blood and what else? His love. Mm. Actually, we can probably say that, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read to you this morning. How about that? The different ways in which the Lord washes us. And I've actually got a picture here for you of those ways. Now let's read in Ephesians. Let's read in Ephesians. And we're going to read 5 and 26. What does it say? So, it speaks about husbands loving their wives. It says, as Christ also loved the church, that he gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Okay, what is the next thing that the Lord uses to clean us? Water of what? Ah, so he cleans us with the, what is his word? Yes, he cleans us with his word, with the Bible. Wow, that's interesting. Then we've had the blood, and what else? We, we read it this morning in Titus. Titus. What else, James? His skin. His skin. Oh. Lay some skin on me, Lord. <laughs> Where's Titus? Who's got Titus for me? Ah, right, here we go. Titus, chapter 3. Now listen to this. It's another way. What have we had so far? We've had blood and the Bible. Okay. It says washing with his word. And he also speaks to the disciples. He says to them, to them you were already clean by the Word I've spoken to you. How do you clean somebody with with words? Do you think? Come on, I'm going to wash you with words, Katie. How will I do that? <laughs> Rub the Bible over you. <laughs> but listen to this, Titus 3 and verse 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so what's the third way in which the Lord washes us? By His Holy Spirit. Let's go through them again. What's the first one? Yes, here's your picture. See? So there, what does that look like? But what does it also look like? Washing <laughs> pad. Yes. So there we go, and I've got your little verses for you on top. So there's the washing powder of the Bible. And that one? You sure? Yes. So you know what color to color that one. <laughs> and that one, what do you think that is? What does that mean? The Holy Spirit. Yeah, so the Lord doesn't just wash you with water. He also washes you with His blood, with? Yes, and His Holy Spirit. Man, how clean do you think we're going to be afterwards? But now, this is the question I want to ask you. Why does the Lord need so many ways to clean us? What is the answer? Why do you think? Why does He need so many ways to clean us? Who knows? Why? Sarah? Okay. Because sometimes the other ways don't work. Ah, that's good. So what does it mean? If we need lots of cleaning, what does it mean we are? 
very dirty. That's right, my angel. The Lord needs all these different ways to clean us because we are so? So dirty. So dirty. Okay. And we need, to, we need Him to show us because we can't really see it. When we look at ourselves, we think we're clean. But actually we're not. Okay. So just think of that while you color in your picture that the Lord needed so many different ways to clean us. For a reason. <laughs> we're not so clean. It's not as clean as we think. Okay. So who's going to pray for us? Caroline's going to pray for us. Thanks, honey. Darling. Thanks, Caroline. So there's your picture. All the different ways. What color will you make that? Green. Yes, for sure. It's great. Nice and clean, Justice. With the young ones afterwards. It's very important. We're going to see where that passage we read first thing this morning from Psalm 51 fits in to the whole picture. Okay. So, let us first of all go to Romans 12. Go back to our reading in Romans 12. And here, of course, last week, as Mark reminded us, this morning we looked at this word transformed, as it's translated in most of our Bibles, but of course it is the word used only in the four places in the New Testament, which is Romans 12, and then we find it also, Paul using it in the letter to the Corinthians, and then we have it in those places where it speaks about Jesus' transfiguration. Same word. What was that word, by the way? Metamorpho. Right, so metamorpho was the word we looked at. And it means to be transfigured. And I hope you've been thinking about the difference between transformed and transfigured. So the same thought that you have had in your mind while reading what those disciples were seeing in the transfiguration of Jesus is the same thought you need to bring to this reading in Romans 12. Same word he uses. Transfigured. But then of course we go a step further and we see there that it says but be ye transformed or transfigured by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's wonderful. I like the way that's been translated. It's very close to the original. So that you can prove, you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And of course that reminds us of our reading earlier on where we looked at the strange statement Paul makes. That you and I have the mind of Christ. Isn't it similar? So here he says now what needs to happen is that your mind needs to be renewed so that you can then test and prove what the perfect will of God is. Who here would like to know the will of God? I won't ask for what reason, because that's where we trip up a little bit. <laughs> we, uh, we'll just stick to that. We, we, we want to know the Lord's will, and Paul actually says, but this is possible. 
He says, but we have the mind of Christ. Okay, and here again he says a similar thing. But now we need to go and look at this word renew. And then we'll move on to our reading there in Titus and also uh, the readings in Corinthians. So let's look at this renew. So now let us think about renewing in terms of our current understanding of that word. So, renew. Gerard, you've been renewed of sorts. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, how would you describe renewal? To be renewed. Painful. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. So, what did they do to your knee? Cut you out. have a new knee, don't you? Yeah, cut out the old and put in the new. Cut out the old and put in new. And the rest of you? That's, that's a work in progress. <laughs> <laughs> so when we think of renew, what? give me some thoughts. What do you think? Something has been renewed. Right, lovely. Excellent. Okay, so you have the old, but you also have the new. Happening all the time. Renew. Okay, if I renew a vehicle. Yeah, the, uh, the biblical way is renewing the, the old mind with the new. Okay, so Gerard is going somewhere. Where are we going? But if I renew a vehicle, what must I do to it? Yeah, paint it over. Get all the dings out, you know? Take it to the panel beater. Get some new parts. Yeah, like Gerard's got some new parts. Okay, now this speaks about the mind. Your mind and mine has to be renewed. What? on earth is he saying? Now let's go to the original language to find out. So the word for renewing of your mind, also the same word that is used in Titus. In fact, it's very interesting that this word, this specific word, is used only twice in the New Testament. Twice. Can you imagine? The one place is here in Romans 12, verse 2. The other place is in Titus. Two places for this word. That's extraordinary. It almost is similar to our other word of last week. Four places. Two places. However, this is the noun. The verb does appear in one or two other places. But the noun, renewing, the renewing, appears only here and in Titus. And we'll turn back to Titus just now. And the word is this, Anna, A-N-A, A-N-A, K-Gnosis, Anna K-Gnosis, K-A-I, this is the second part of the word, K-I-I-N-O-S-I-S, Anna K-Gnosis. Let's break it up into two parts. The first part, Anna, Means, hmm? no, <laughs> upward, yes, that's not bad. Anna means full of grace. A in A, one A. So the first part is, Heidi is quite right, because remember not long ago we had this word blepo for C, and there was this word Anna blepo, and it meant? Oh, you'll know, Mel, is to look upward. So, this word, Anna, has to do with upward, but it also has to do with again. Upward again. And kainos, now, kainos is interesting. There are two words for new in Greek. The one is neos, N-E-O-S, and the other one is kainos, 
Neos means new in the sense of um, I've just grown a new hair. No, I haven't really. <laughs> or a car, you know, has just run off the production line. You know the kind of new that I mean? New as in young. New as in it's brand new. But this is not what that word means. This word means different. So they use the translation new, but they should really have said different. So I don't want you to think that this mind of yours and mine is made new in the sense of just renewed. What's that? Yes. It is not what it used to be at all. New in the sense of completely different. So, it's, an, it's a difficult thing to translate. But what it really means, where did we see last week, Scripture says, the, the creation verb, who is it ascribed to? Remember when we looked at the poem, and that Greek word, poemi, was really just the word for creation by using words, which is ascribed to the living God. God creates with words. So here, the correct translation of the word renewing is, <laughs> is created again, upward, differently. It's quite interesting. Created again, differently. It is not just that I say, all right, Lord, there are a few tweaks that needs to be made here. Thank you, Lord, it's back on track. You've renewed it. He says, no, that's not renewing at all. In fact, what do you think will happen to just such a mind? Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is very important for us. We need to realize that what Paul is writing here to us is, no, don't think of renew in the, in the sense that you do. I'm talking created anew differently. Okay. Because the reason why we struggle with making peace with that passage, we have the mind of Christ, is why. Why do we all hesitate when I ask that question? Because you don't feel? Yeah. We still have sound mind. <laughs> we still have unsound mind. That's right, because we, we feel, actually, I, I, I have my own mind. I'm fighting my own mind all the time. And yet Paul writes, for we have the mind of Christ. Is it one of those things that we just have to repeat over and over and over and over and then it will be so? I wonder. <laughs> well, that doesn't work as we know. So, keep this in mind. It is a brand new creation. Creating a new, not renewed. Okay. Let's look at Romans 11 just to bring the point home a little bit. What does he say? And I mean... This, is, this comes before what Paul writes elsewhere. Romans 11, verse 34, and there's even other scriptures like in Isaiah that says the same thing. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been His yeah. counselor? And of course, immediately what we think of is the saying that we all say when things just doesn't work out the way we planned them. We say God's ways are not our ways. And our ways are not God's ways. His ways are higher. And then we sort of, it's sort of a passive sort of, um, oh well, you know, it's like a verse we use. When things have not worked out, the way we thought they would. 
then we use that. We say, oh well, I'll just, you know, settle for this because God's ways are higher. But heck, that is not at all what Paul is saying. He says, you have the mind of Christ. Oh, my word. Now, hang on a minute. How does that occur? Well, here it is. It needs to be created all over again and different to the one you had before. Okay? Renewed. And therefore, he can say these things. And of course, we read in our readings. What did we read? We read all these marvelous things that Paul uses to actually... Let's go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. What does he all say there to us? He speaks of something that no eye has seen, nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For what man knoweth the things of a man save the Spirit of man which in him? So also the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we may know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, the human mind, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual but the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to him. So he's speaking about the spiritual man. And then he comes with verse 16. He says, For who has known the mind of the Lord that we may instruct him? And we expect him to say, It's unknowable. In fact, there is the song. Who is it that sings the song? Simon and Garfunkel. Yeah. Oh, that's our time, eh, John? He sings, uh, the information is, yeah, God makes his plans, the information is unavailable to the mortal man. There's the song. Well, part of it anyway. And that's the way we see it. The information is unavailable to the mortal man, and that's what we expect Paul to say to us right there. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? And then we go, yes, God's ways are higher than ours. And then he says, but we have the mind of Christ. That is something for us to chew on. But you can only have it if your mind has been created brand new, differently. Okay. And now, this leads us to this amazing word. We're going to jump back to Romans 12 and verse 2. And we're going to look at... Something there which is just marvelous. In fact, let's go to 2 Corinthians 11 rather. Sorry, 2 Corinthians 11. Okay, it is used there in Romans 12, but it's much better here in 2 Corinthians 11. And this is the reason why we read it. Okay, let's go there. 2 Corinthians 11. And I'm going to just read to you from the King James. I don't know what it is in your Bible, but pay careful attention to this. Whatever it is in your Bible, I'm going to ask you. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. Okay. Now if we only read in the NIV or any one of the other versions, we read transformed in Romans 12. And we read transformed here in these verses. And we say, oh yeah, it's probably all the same thing. My word. We've already dealt with Romans 12, haven't we? It's transfigured. Mm. What do you think this transformed is? And it's amazing. 
transformed. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we've got oh, whose Bible's got masquerade? Yeah. Okay, most of you. Ha, huh, that's beautiful. Masquerade. Now, I want to give you this amazing word. Last week we looked at, at this word transfigured, which was in the Greek metamorpho. Right, welcome to the opposite of metamorpho. It's meta, again, M E T A. Meta, and it is schema, meta schema titzo. Meta schema titzo. Okay? It's the opposite of meta morpho. Right. So Paul uses this word meta schema titzo. And what does meta schema titzo mean? All right. Let's go, first of all, with what do you hear from the word that you might recognize? Scheming, <laughs> Scheming okay. Disguising. Schizophrenic. <laughs> yeah, it could well come from this word. Well, a schema in Greek, a schema is a diagram of something's um, qualities or characteristics. That's the word. Schema in Greek means the diagram or the full summary of something's characteristics. Outward characteristics. That's what schema means in Greek. Okay. So that's it. It is Schema. Now there are other parts of this word, and one of the parts refers to the self. Now let's go again and read here in the King James, because this is where it's correctly translated. Verse 13, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming, metaschema titsoing, them <laughs> selves. Okay. Okay, so what? Do you have in your Bible there? I've got a breakdown of that one. Masquerading as apostles of Christ. Now Paul exposes these with these super apostles as false apostles and servants of Satan who are covering up their own identity. Well, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Right? Copying how you're supposed to be. Ah, now it's very interesting. I said to you this morning that meta schema titzo is the opposite of meta Morpho. Right, so now meta schema. Schema is a complete diagram or description of something's characteristics. Meta schema titzo means to do it your self. Now, in a way, the translation masquerading is not bad, isn't it? Because what have those super apostles gone and done? Well, before they can even copy it. Yes. They need a schema. There it is. S-C-H-E-M-A. I need a schema. I need a diagram of the attributes. Oh, here's one. Good. Now I can meta schema titzo. I can transform myself into this. Okay, so how's that going to work out for them? What will they what will they manage to do? What ah <laughs> Dave. Because you see, these attributes, where from which perspective are they looking at them? From the outside. Ah, lovely. But they're working with a schema. And of course, it is in their own strength. Well, Heights, I tell you what, here Paul uses this of apostles. These super apostles came with letters from Jerusalem. 
letters of recommendation. They are the same ones of whom he says, I don't need letters of recommendation. You are my letters. Remember that? So it's actually talking about ministers, Christians. And here's the thing. Metamorpho is done by God. Metaschematizo is done by you and me. And I love the fact that it's translated masquerade. It's quite cute actually, isn't it? It's quite neat. Because that's exactly what it is. But I wanted to give you the word behind it. It's the opposite of metamorpho. So now, if I, if we follow Paul here, and of course in Titus, he uses exactly the same word as we had previously in Kainos, the renewing of the mind. But let's just go and remind ourselves who's got that Titus reading. It's Titus 3, verse 5. Who's quick? Yeah, anyone. Just read it. Thanks, Jen. Remind people to be submissive to their natural state. Are you on it from verse 5? Verse 5. Oh, sorry. Of Titus 3. He saved us not because of any works of righteousness that we have done, but because of his own pity and mercy, by the cleansing bath of the new birth, the regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so that regeneration is actually a very interesting Greek word. It means again to be born, again to be conceived. It's similar to the word used in John. Regeneration and renewal and so forth, okay? But who does that? Does it clearly say? The Holy Spirit does it. You cannot take a schema. And this is what I see people do with this. You know what some Christians call this? Especially when it comes to Jesus. Oh, we must be like who? Jesus, yes. We Christians, we must be like Christ. Right. Guys, I found a schema. It's here. Yeah, I see, I'll tell you exactly what he did, and how he did it, and what he said. And all we need to do is follow the schema and add the tizzo to it, doing it ourselves. Oh my goodness. But he uses it of false prophets, and he says they're masquerading. Oh man, it's not a schema. It's not a summary of attributes. Who here wants to be metaschematizod? Who here is doing that? Yeah, that's the problem with us. We do that. And Paul says it is of the devil, just like Heidi said. He says that's all the devil needs to do. But you know what? The real thing, this renewing, the anarcano, the renewing of your mind, the creating of it all over again differently, and the metamorpho brings you to a different place. <laughs> I have met ministers who have identified the schema and are metaschematizoing. I've met them. How do you think they feel? Very righteous, self-righteous. <laughs> of course it's going to end up that way. It doesn't feel genuine. And yet their intent is beautiful. Their intent is wonderful. Let me follow the schema, the description of attributes. And it's the opposite of metamorpho. It's what the devil does. But there is one thing. You know, I spoke to a lady the other day who is very afraid that she will be deceived in the end. Because it says even the elect could be deceived in the end by this angel of light. But I want you to know that you will be able to tell the difference. Because he's using a schema. He's using a description, a very clear description of attributes and mimicking, mimicking them. 
And there's going to be something in you, the Spirit of God, who will simply not be able to connect with that at all because you cannot connect with a schema. Like Paul says, that is the spiritual man is the one who receives these things. Not the, the carnal mind can't even, but he can work according to a schema. It's incredible, isn't it? Meta schema titso, the opposite of metamorpho. And if we are in any way involved in meta schema titso, we will only ever be able to land up there where we have an outward appearance of, but the genuine article is missing. And this morning, the Lord really laid it on my heart that we need to go back to Psalm 51. And I want to show you what he says before this verse that I read to you. It's very important. We speak a lot about, and we have the last few weeks spoken about the transfiguration. Here we hear of the anakinos, the renewing, making over again differently. And we read of this counterfeit thing which is working according to a schema. But how does this start? How does it happen? What does David say? I read verse 10 to you. Now you understand it a bit better. He says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. But what goes before this statement? Like what we discussed with the young ones there. The whole psalm before that. Verse 2. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Purge me, verse 7, with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Hide thy face from my sins. And then he says, create in me a clean heart, O God. So when you ask me, how does this transformation take place? What must I do? What has... Well, you have to be cleaned up, you and me. We need to be cleaned up before that process can even begin. That cleansing comes before the renewing and the transformation. Do you see there in Psalm 51? And never mind how clean we think we are this morning. Believe you me, we're not. And we want that regeneration. We want that renewing. We want not to be working according to a schema. We want the metamorpho, but... You know where it starts? It starts with conviction of sin. That's where it starts. So this morning, that's what we're going to do. Just in our prayer time right now. We're not going to say this or do this or do that, Lord. Actually, we've got to start at the beginning. Show me my sin. That I can come to you. That you can clean me up. That this whole thing can go forward. That's what's important. So let's just pray together.